All right, welcome back for the uh, next video in this series. All right, in case you've forgotten, I'm Blake Flannery, and I'm one of the cadre with the Ryan Training Group and then my company, Mover Training Solutions. And these videos are in support of some of the training that we do with the small unit maneuver and small unit sustainment classes. Uh, going through the equipment list that is on the website for those classes, kind of explaining what the items are and how you can put all this together. Really now we're to the meat and potatoes of this series, which is the ruck, all right? We talked about items that are worn on the body, we talked about the fighting load, all that stuff's pretty simple, and the ruck is simple too, but there's a lot more little parts that go into it, and so we start thinking about how we pack those items. So we're gonna get into that. Now, if you aren't familiar with it, haven't seen before on the Orion Training Group channel, there is a video I did on packing the ruck and it is just general tips on how to pack so we're going to cover some of that again in this video and talking through why these items are in the pack and based off of the equipment list for the class we're going to start by opening up the uh, main compartment pulling the items out talking about them really quick and how they're packed in there then do all the items on the outside and then you get to see me shove everything back in here in an organized fashion, right? So, kicking it off. Now this ruck is a Tactical Tailor uh, Malice ruck. There's a lot of really good packs that are out there. Um, I'm sure that, you know, coming in this video, you're probably really hoping that I would tell you what ruck to use what is the best ruck out there either because you don't feel like doing any research or you're hoping that i will provide you with confirmation bias and name your favorite ruck this is my favorite the tack taylor malice <clears throat> doesn't mean it's the best it just means it's what i've used the most and it's worked out really well for me i've got mystery ranch packs they work really great uh, burley stock makes good packs kifaru hill people gear uh, there's there's a lot out there, right? Do the research, look at the packs. If you can get hands on them in a shop, that's even better. But you'll find a pack that you really like, right? The uh, Mal's pack has been good for me because as a recon marine, I had to pack a lot of stuff in the field all the time, and we're gonna kind of get through some of those items as I would pack them. So starting with the first thing that's on top, and the way that I prefer to carry my water bladder that I will drink is I just lay it flat on top of the ruck vast majority of the time, All right? <clears throat> this was done because it kept that weight of that water bladder up high rather than it being tucked back somewhere else. And I could better ensure that there wouldn't be so much pressure on the bladder uh, to try and mitigate damage to it, popping, anything like that. Uh, there was a time uh, where I used to take old camouflage uniforms and I would cut the leg off the trousers and then I would shoe goo one end closed and that would become a sleeve for the water bladders in my pack. But I got rid of those before I retired. So I don't have a protective sleeve on this one, but that is uh, one way you can make a very simple and lightweight, just add a little layer of protection to these bladders because obviously they run a risk of popping or puncturing, right? So be smart in how you pack them. The hose goes over my shoulder and I can drink from this uh, as I go along. I prefer to only drink on halts because uh, that helps me manage the water. Now, if you're thirsty, you should drink, but you should go into a field operation already hydrated. So you're just trying to maintain. So I drink on halts. I try not to just suck the whole thing down because you do have to ration your water to a degree, All right? So there's that. Now also for water, I have this five quart MSR dromedary bag. This is what I would use to start replenishing other water sources. Because I can drink from the Camelback on the move via the hose and because as I deplete it, it collapses on itself and it doesn't make a bunch of noise. So I will refill that with other water sources I have uh, rather than drinking 
from those other water sources. And this is one of those primary ways of refilling the Camelback as I go along. This way, I used to carry two Camelbacks and I'd have a bunch of hoses. Now just one hose makes it a little bit simpler and I can refill my water off of this. Depending on the size of your unit, you might carry out whatever is your allotment of water and then something like this to resupply the team as you go along and carry you over to an external resupply point. So there's that guy. He's a little more rugged than the Camelback, but still you have to consider what's gonna happen if that thing pops, All right? So now the other thing, the ruck is sustainment. That's my sustainment load. It carries all the things that I need to keep myself in the field. Uh, it's got my water, it's got my chow, it's got warming layers and all that. But I'm out here for a specific reason, right? So I need equipment to support that mission. And I carry that equipment in my assault load, which is this smaller pack, right? Now the reason that I prefer the Malice Ruck in these large mountain ruck style because it allows me to put my assault load inside the ruck, keep the whole thing enclosed, and just makes a life a little bit simpler. There are pack systems where this would be designed to go on top of the pack, like the current Marine Corps issue pack system. Uh, Mystery Ranch has pack lids that turn into small backpacks like this. So there are multiple ways to satisfy this requirement, right? But this way I like to do it, a small frame pack that goes, or unframed, is a small size pack that goes inside my main ruck. And this has the mission essential equipment, which I'll break into after I finish everything with the main pack, all right? So that's simulating pretty much what I would carry as a team leader. And then this tripod goes along with it, all right? So now what's left in the pack is again, the primary things of a sustainment load being food, more water, hygiene, uh, and then some sheltering items, all right? Uh, one item I typically keep at the top of the pack is, you know, a uh, scarf or schmug, or pretty sure that's not how you say it, but that's how I'm saying it. I carry one of these. These have a lot of uses. Um, the little tassels are usually annoying, but this is actually a pretty good piece of gear. There's a lot of uses for this, and so I always like having one uh, with me. Sometimes I just shove it in my cargo pocket, or I'll just keep it in the ruck, all right? Also towards the top, I have this wind shirt. As you can tell, it's a very warm and sunny day out, but I always have at least a wind shirt, if not some kind of Gore-Tex jacket so if it starts to rain, I can throw this on either over the top of my field jacket or put it underneath uh, if I'm worried about it getting damaged with the underbrush. And it'll help keep me drier from outside uh, moisture, but it also won't overheat me. So that's why it's such a lightweight layer for this weather. And then in this waterproof bag, I have a waffle top and a beanie. Even though it's really warm, I always carry out these two layers at a minimum because even in hot weather, it is possible for guys to succumb to hypothermia. Uh, if you get wet, you get a really cold night, you can still you know, go hypothermic potentially. So having some layers to throw on is helpful uh, if it's, really, really hot. There have been times patrolling in the desert where I opted not to carry the waffle top, but the beanie for sure is always in my ruck, all right? And these are in a waterproof bag just to keep them dry so that when I need them, they're at their best capacity. All right, so from there, we, you know, already dealing with some, uh, <clears throat> some layering items. Here I have my poncho liner, or otherwise affectionately known as the Whoopie. So it's an old issue M81 poncho liner, right? And again, it's carried in a waterproof bag. 
because it in itself is not waterproof. So if I have to cross a river, uh, anything like that, I know that this will be protected. That way when I need it, it's gonna do its job because it won't be soaking wet, right? And it's in a larger bag, so I've got more room if I need to throw more items in, in this bag to protect them from the river crossing or a downpour, then I've got the space to do so. Okay, so kind of the, the last thing that I have along those veins of sheltering, uh, so that's like layers I can add uh, and then actually being able to create shelter for myself uh, it's just an old school poncho, right? This one is uh, the DCU or tricolor desert, right? Again, this is a very useful item because you can wear it, right? And I can throw this on, it will drape over the pack, it'll drape over the front of my, uh, my fighting load. So if I'm looking to really try to keep myself dry from a, a light rain, as long as it's, or even a, a heavier rain, as long as it's not too windy, uh, poncho is really great for that, or just in general, and then it can be set up uh, as an A-frame. You can you know, fly a tarp with your poncho and create lean-tos and things like that and make shelter with it. So I always like a poncho because it has those multiple uses, all right? Um, you know, I, I put it in a post, uh, probably be about a month or so prior to when you guys see this video. But when you're packing your ruck, and this in general, and I don't know if I've mentioned the other videos, but you got two is one, one is none. So Two is one, one is none is redundancy, right? I want to have some levels of redundancy. So that means sometimes having more than one of a certain item because it could be consumed or it is fragile enough that it's likely to break in the field environment. So you have a backup, but that's also carrying items that have more than one use, all right? If I have an item that only has one use, then I probably want to look at, do I really need it? right? It's like warming layers only really have one use. You put it on to keep you a little bit warmer and to prevent from becoming a cold weather injury. If it's not likely whatsoever that you're going to need that layer for the environment, then you don't bring it, right? Because it only has that one use, okay? So finishing out what we have here in the bottom of the pack, uh, the least important from a mission standpoint but still necessary is food, all right? So I've got a few MREs in here. All right, four MREs in the bottom of the pack, all right? <clears throat> now, MREs do suck, and I definitely avoid eating MREs whenever possible. Uh, these are normally kept in a bin in my garage so the next time a uh, Hurricane Florence blows through and we are isolated from the outside world, we have food for days and days. Not the tastiest, but it works. Uh, as Recon Marine, we would take out two MREs per day and we would strip those down and get rid of all the absolutely unnecessary components, which, yeah, it alleviates a little bit of weight, but mostly makes them easier to pack down and uh, keep them out of the way, right? Now there's other types of food, right? You know, packs like this where you have dehydrated or this is just a simple granola pack, right? Um, the thing about that, if you bring foods like this, you have to rehydrate them, which means using your water. Now you are gonna consume that water, right? <clears throat> but you might need to think about how easy is it gonna be to procure water from the environment uh, and should you maybe pack a little bit more if you're gonna be using your water to make your food as well, all right? Uh, now getting in the outside of the pack, actually we'll go over here because, all right, another food option is trail mix, all right? Now I prefer to go to the store and buy things in bulk and make my own rather than this pre-made stuff um, and specifically this one, because I'm really not a fan of raisins or cranberries, but I bought this anyways, and now I'm forced to eat it all because I don't waste food. So it's gonna suck, but also be slightly tasty and nourishing. But trail mix is great because this stuff doesn't freeze uh, and it doesn't melt. 
like yes, in cold weather, the, the dried fruit will get much tougher. Uh, but it's not like if you've ever been in cold weather and brought something like a power bar or a cliff bar, that's like trying to gnaw on a chunk of ice, right? You got to keep it inside your jacket and thaw it out and then you can finally eat it. So uh, trail mix is really good for that, right? Kind of an all weather food item. Uh, whereas like your MREs, your typical MREs don't do well in the freezing temperatures because they freeze and now you're trying to expend extra energy finding ways to thaw them. Uh, and there's more room for somebody who doesn't think so well to do something stupid, like light the package on fire. So make sure you're packing smartly for your environment with the food you choose to bring out, all right? What? Now in this other pack, other pouch out here, a uh, couple pairs of extra socks, all right? Now for the class, and when I did that last uh, how to pack a ruck video for uh, OTG, a lot of people were super upset that I had a bag of six pairs of socks. And that is because by the packing list, it is required you have one pair of socks for every day of the class. And I highly recommend two. So for three days out in the bush, it would be six pairs of socks. Now for me, I've got two in here and I would maybe only pack one extra pair of socks for a 48 to 72 hours in the field in most environments. That's me based off of my experiences and knowing that I can comfortably push that. Uh, it may be a little rough towards the end of that 72 hours if my feet are soaking wet, but with well-made wool socks, you're gonna be all right. And then you can see in this one, it has a lot of body powder. I've shared about this before, but I have powder packed in here, so it's already in the sock, and I can use that as part of my hygiene whenever I change my socks, all right? Now, this front pouch is where I basically have all of my hygiene stuff. So one item to consider are wag bags, okay? You can in a lot of environments, just dig a hole and piss and defecate in a hole and then cover it back up. But again, depending on the environment, that might not be so feasible. So packing out some wag bags. The problem is this has to go back in your pack once you have made use of it. So you want to consider that. You might use this initially and then move off to another point where you can bury and cache these. No, that's not environmentally sound, but we're not worried about the environment, we're worried about the mission. So I've got some wag bags in here. This is my hygiene kit. So within this kit, I can clean my teeth. I've got pain meds, I've got cough drops, I've got bug spray, I've got rehydration salts, just really basic things to keep myself relatively clean. It's not about being spick and span and smelling fresh. It's about making sure you don't get so dirty and nasty and grimy that you end up getting sick, right? Also in cold weather, if your layers get full of the gunk off your skin as you sweat and you overwork yourself, they're not going to do as good of a job as they start to fill with dirt from you sweating in your pores or just from the environment. So trying to keep yourself clean within reason is gonna be important in the field, prevent getting sick and uh, infections and things like that. Uh, I also have a small pack, extra pack of wipes that goes along with the, uh, the wag bag. Uh, of course, depending on your environment, you can get clever and you can use leaves. Just be smart about which leaves you choose. And if they're leaves of three and shiny, don't wipe your butt with those. And part of my mess kit is just, you know, a little spork food, spork deal, right? And that would be for eating the, uh, the granola, or if you bring any kind of freeze dried rations, you're gonna want that spoon. Obviously the MREs come with spoons in them. Uh, you can also strip the spoons out and just carry a singular spoon, which lightens the weight a little bit, makes them easier to pack down, and just makes your whole packing experience just a bit easier. But that's your choice. Now, how so high up? I have these 
South African Defense Force uh, two quart canteens, all right? So these are really cool uh, because of their form factor, right? Now a US two quart, which uh, when I was preparing for this video, I thought I still had a handful and uh, to my chagrin, I do not have any more US two quarts and that makes me feel like a sham. But I have these foreign ones and they're good because of this form factor. They fit very well into these uh, taller side pouches and you know, they don't fall over. They're a good deal. Uh, the downside is that they aren't like the US two quart and they're not collapsible, right? So kind of mentioned it with the uh, Camelback. Camelback's great because as you drink from it, it closes in on itself and that water doesn't slosh around. If I take a sip of water out of this, there's now an air pocket inside this canteen. And when I start to move again, it will start making a lot of noise. Right now, I've squeezed all the air I possibly can out of it, so it's as quiet as it can be, right? So if I'm gonna drink from a rigid container, rather than everyone in the team halting and everyone pulls out a canteen and starts drinking, which one means you're losing all security, one person pulls out a rigid canteen and you pass it around the team until the canteen is gone. If you're the leader and you believe that guys need more water, then you break out a second rigid container. However, what I prefer to do, like I said, is drink from the collapsible source and then refill it with this. So once I've depleted two quarts out of that Camelback, I'll pull one of these out and uh, drop that in. And now I don't have to worry about the noise from it being a partial canteen. And for weight balance and total of water, I have another one on the other side of the pack. And as you're doing this, and we'll talk about it as I put everything back in, you wanna make sure this pack is as balanced as possible. If all of your weight is more to one side than the other, that's gonna cause you to try and counter that. And that's gonna give you a lot of problems even before you get out of the field. Uh, <clears throat> and on that note, shameless plug on Instagram, Tactical Lifters Guild has lots of information on how you can recover and then prepare yourself for having to wear a load on your body and carry that load. Yeah. All right, and continue on. Uh, you know, the pack's almost empty at this point. Uh, moving on down to the lower pockets, uh, more water. All right. Water is incredibly important, right? You can go for a while without food. You can find ways to warm yourself, uh, but you can't just have a mindset and tell yourself you're hydrated. You can identify as hydrated all you want and you will still die. So have water with you, right? So in this pack, I have 12 quarts of water in total as you, if you've been counting as I pull this stuff out and of course, so we talk about balance. I've got another one right on this side, okay? 12 quarts is a lot of water to pack out. Uh, it's heavy. The reason that I am so used to packing out large amounts of water is the same reason I have so much ammo on my fighting load, is when you are a dedicated ground reconnaissance asset, you are not gonna be in a position where say supporting unit can come out and bring you more water, more chow, more batteries, you know, every 24 hours. You are in bad guy country, you are line of sight to something controlled by the bad guys and that's why you're out there, you're doing reconnaissance surveillance on their stuff and their terrain. So to limit your overall signature and preserve the sanctity of your reconnaissance task and the overall mission, you gotta be able to keep yourself in the field and sustain yourself for longer periods of time. And uh, that's what the small unit sustainment class is all about, is providing you some of those techniques and means that I used in my career. One of those is packing out a lot of water, right? Now, granted, if you're in an environment where you know for sure there's gonna be a lot of water on the ground, running streams and rivers, 
then you can definitely plan to sustain off of that. You have to be careful because you're not gonna be the only creature going down towards the water. And every time you go to resupply, whether you're off the land or someone's bringing it to you, that is a higher risk of compromising your mission, all right? So I pack out a lot of water. Again, these are flexible, so as I drink out of these, I can collapse it down. No air pockets. No, it is not a tactical color because I would not sit out in the open and pull this thing out and drink from it. This would be something that I take cover and concealment, I'm in a hide site, and I drink from that. <clears throat> Doesn't mean it's the best thing out there, but it is a useful tool and I do have to be careful of the fact that those are not the most durable of collapsible uh, water sources, so they could pop within the ruck. It's a risk, but over the 10 plus years that I've been using those, I have yet to have one break on me, so I'm doing pretty good with managing my equipment in that regard, all right? All right, this last pocket right here, uh, again, normally, I would put a US-2 quart and some water purification items in here, uh, but it didn't, so instead I just put this tarp, all right? Now I have the poncho, so having a separate tarp is often not going to be necessary, but where I can use this other than just basic shelter would be in actually building my hide site. I can set this up, it'll provide me with some shade, uh, which is definitely nice. Uh, I can help protect me from the rain, which you might think, well, you're a Rikondo, you should be tough and be able to sit in the rain. And though I can, it's a lot easier to sustain on mission when you're not constantly soaking wet and worried about going hypothermic. And it's a lot easier to write reports and handle electronic uh, equipment like laptops and range finders and things like that when you're not worried about the rain damaging them. So. This is a pretty useful tool for setting up at least part of your hide site because it helps protect your equipment uh, as well as the individuals, all right? So it does give me more than one possible use because I can use it as simple as a survival shelter or building up a hide site and protecting uh, equipment. But again, based on the environment I'm going into, if I can get away with just the poncho, then I won't pack out a separate tarp. For the small unit sustainment class, this is a required item because we will cover building shelters. Uh, and that way everyone has a dedicated tarp for that piece of practical application. And then the uh, poncho is there as a backup to increase the size of your shelter, or it can just be worn as a poncho, you know, if it starts raining, it's also a good lightweight rain layer, right? So I've got that. Uh, on the bottom of the pack, I'm just going to talk about this because this is again something we can get in the weeds with and I want to avoid it. I have my ghillie hood, all right? It's just strapped to the bottom of the pack. It's rolled in on itself. That way I don't have too much of this scrim hanging out that will just snag on vegetation. And then if I'm moving through more open terrain, I can pull it out, throw that on and wear the pack over it. Although in reality, you're exerting so much effort with the heavy pack with the fighting load on that usually this is reserved for once I've occupied a static position, I've taken the ruck off, I throw the ghillie hood on and I sit in an observation post and I record and report and that just aids in my overall concealment. But you can use it on movement as well, all right? Coming up to the top of the pack in the lid, just why I've chosen to stick my e-tool, all right? <clears throat> now, an e-tool is a very nice piece of equipment to have in the field. Uh, this is one of those things where not everyone needs to carry it. If you're infantry and maybe some other, you know, conventional side MOSs that spend a lot of time in the field, it's probably required that every single person packs out their e-tool or entrenching tool. Uh, in reconnaissance teams, not everyone packs it out because we have a lot of stuff going in these rucks. So like one for every two, one for every three, packs out an e-tool. We use this to dig in, improve our sights. And then again, if I need to use the bathroom, dig a hole, do my business in the hole and then cover it up. So 
An e-tool is definitely a necessary item in the field, but in the team environment, not everybody needs to bring one. And if you're going out on your own, you could also get away with just a simple gardening trowel, uh, depending on what it is you're doing in your outing. You're just hunting, going backpacking. Trowel is fine, because you're not trying to dig in a fighting position. All right, and then in the uh, lid of the pack, I have some means for uh, gathering and purifying water so that I can refill my drinking containers. And I just keep that up here at the top of the pack. And that's my primary means of uh, resupplying for water off of the environment. All right. Uh, that covers all the items that go into the main pack itself. Uh, now, before we get into repacking it, I'm gonna cover what went into or goes into the assault load like I said I would. So, lay you down. All right. So what I have here for my assault load uh, is, uh, it's before Arbor Arms was Arbor Arms and they were Ares Armor, uh, this was their tradesman pack, all right? Uh, it's a great little pack. Um, check them out, uh, Arbor Arms. You fit a lot of stuff in this pack and the design of the current version is far improved from this one and this is already a good pack. So definitely recommend it. Now what I tried to do here was best replicate what I would carry as a team leader uh, in a recon team. So I did have the uh, tripod that was packed separate and it was packed separate because if something happens, we make uh, enemy contact and we're being pursued, we can't break contact fast enough with our heavy rucks on. Well, then you would drop ruck, you would grab your go bag, uh, and then continue to break contact. Now you're able to move a little bit faster. I don't need the tripod. That is not absolute mission essential. I can always get away with stabilizing it off the pack or stringing up some 550 cord between branches and creating a support for scopes and binos in that fashion. So you pack it out because it is a nice, useful tool, but you can improvise if you have to, all right? So within the pack, I've got a couple different uh, nets, all right? These would both be used in construction of the position itself, as well as camouflaging the observation equipment that I'm gonna set up, all right? Have a spotting scope, and that'd be the primary thing to go on the uh, tripod. As well, in here, I've got uh, more for water purification. Uh, it's the little device that creates a solution that I then drop into a um, drinking source like the Camelback, and it will purify the water, all right? So that is part of my means in an emergency situation of how I would have to purify water, gathering more as I go, because at that point, I'm gonna be down just this one cord that's on the fighting load if I have to drop my pack. Uh, you wanna avoid that, obviously. <clears throat> this other pouch, again, another little net, uh, and that little net inside this pouch helps fill it out so that the rangefinder and more chem lights that are kept in this pouch uh, don't bounce around and make any undue noise. And then again, it just helps with camouflaging your equipment and your position. And then this bottom pouch, I've got binos. So binos are one of those things. Now I've got the range finder that has a little bit of magnification. I've got a spotting scope and I've got these binos. So this is some of that two is one, one is none redundancy and observation equipment. If I were ever going to drop a uh, piece of observation equipment, it was always simple binoculars, uh, especially because our range finder were binoculars. So between binoculars, spotting scopes, the high powered scopes on our sniper rifles, an extra set of regular binos wasn't gonna do us a whole lot of good. But I'm putting it in here to help better mimic the total loadout of what I would bring. And binos are good for your scans. And then when you think you find something, 
you go to the higher powered spotting scope and dial in on that spot and then see if you actually did find something or if your eyes are just playing tricks on you. I have my reporting formats uh, to go off of. So I've talked about these before on Instagram as well. You wanna know your reports before you go out. That way you understand the information needs to be collected, but you should always bring the guides out there with you because additional reconnaissance tasks may pop up, additional reports may be needed that you didn't anticipate and these are how you remember what goes into those reports and how to format them. Uh, and then I have some camouflage face paint. This is a uh, charcoal based, uh, it's green and uh, it's very liquidy. So it goes into the beard. And if you wanna find out what that looks like, you're gonna have to come to class or you know, wait for content from class to come out that has me with camouflage paint all over my face. But come to class and you get to find out what that looks like, all right? So that is my assault load. Uh, the only thing I don't have out of all this that should be carried is spare batteries. So I don't have any spare batteries for the, some of the smaller electronic devices uh, right now. And then when I was uh, active duty still, we had large radios used to communicate long range and they took big heavy batteries, so I'd usually have another eight of those, which would add about another 10 pounds uh, to the loadout. And that's why really there's still a lot of space left in this pack uh, once all this stuff is added and why I carry such a big pack, because again, there's a lot of stuff I had to pack out on mission. So this is the basis for it. And now we are just going to put it all back inside the ruck. Uh, I'm not gonna talk too much about it, going to just go through it and you get to see it and again you can go reference the uh, other video on the Orion training group channel where I talk much more in detail about some tips for actually packing various items all right well now you've watched me pull all this crap out now I'm going to stick all of it back in not going to go too much into detail you're going to watch me do it I'll talk through it as I do it uh just because we had the other video on the Ryan Training Group channel that does really go more in depth about some packing tips, but I'll kind of explain as I go. Uh, another important thing when you're packing the ruck is considering the accessibility of the individual components and how often you're gonna need to access those components and for what. So if it's something I need to access quickly or often, then I wanna make sure that it's either at the top of the pack or in an exterior pouch like this one, all right? Now obviously a tarp isn't something I need to access a whole lot, but in this case, it's just made for a convenient place to stick it, all right? Again, I don't have to worry about the fact those water bottles aren't a tactical color because they're totally enclosed in a camouflage pouch. So, all set there. Now I'll start packing the main ruck. Put the MREs in there first. The bottom, least accessible item because Chow's a crutch. And likewise, as I would eat one of these, put all the trash back in the pouch, and then it would also go back into the bottom of the pack. Nice big heavy item, put that close to the body. Get my salt bag in. Take that, shove the poncho liner in, get it 
down there. And now I know I'm not going to trap too much air. Close this thing up. Doesn't need to be super tight because I am not going to be crossing any rivers with it. Let's take this bag of warm layers on the other side down towards the bottom. Evens everything out and it's light so it can sit down there. Poncho, go over the top of the poncho liner. That way I know my sheltering stuff is on that side. Wind shirt goes on top of the warming layer bag so I know layers are on that left side. Stick my socks back in this outside pouch which normally would be used to hold a uh, radio battery. But fortunately, I don't have to worry about 5590s anymore. Dang. What was once a radio pouch is now a snack pouch. Hygiene items, again, something I'm going to use fairly often. So it's nice and accessible without hindering any of the mission essential equipment. Take this tripod, set it on down in there. Right there at the top, keeps weight up high. Line that up, and inside my flap, where I keep my e-tool. All right, so there you have it. Everything packed back in in just a couple minutes. And that comes from having done this thousands of times of just unpacking everything, repacking it, <clears throat> unpacking it, repacking it, rifling through rucks on mission to find the items that I need. I have developed a system for how I want to compartmentalize the load. So in the dark, when I need to access the pack, I can find the items I'm looking for without turning on a light and relying on visual. I just rely on touch and knowing where things are supposed to be within the pack. So definitely wanna make sure that you go through this multiple times, you know, pack it, put it on, walk around a little bit in it, see how it feels, take it off, unpack it entirely. And even something as simple as how you roll up a jacket or how you fold an item can be the determination between it being easy to pack or difficult, all right? So that's the ruck. That is my sustainment load and assault load. And this is pretty much everything that I will be carrying in 
the small unit maneuver, small unit sustainment classes. Uh, with an exception to some of this stuff, observation equipment I won't bring because it's not necessary for the class. Just using here for the video for demonstration of filling it out and giving an idea of what mission essential items look like. If you're in the infantry, that's going to become ammunition for crew serve weapons and additional ammunition for your own organic weapons. Uh, if you're communications, you're going to have a lot more communications equipment, batteries for it and cables, things like that. Whatever your job might be, military or otherwise, it's going to end up dictating what you need to carry in your ruck. But you have your basic items, you have your sustainment, you have your assault load that's really going to support your mission and putting it all together in a means that makes sense and keeps things that need to be accessible, accessible to you. And of course, keep it as balanced as possible so that way you're not spending your entire time under that load trying to counter to one side or the other. You just want to be able to stand up straight, lean forward a little bit from the ankles to counter that weight. There's another reason I like chest rigs is this weight on the front of me helps balance the weight that's on the back. So that's it. Again, this is to support the small unit maneuver and small unit sustainment classes going off of the gear list uh, for those two classes. So if you're signed up, the, this video and this, this whole series we've been doing is a primer for you to use before you come to class. But even if you're not signed up for the class and you never wanna sign up for a class, that's fine. You can also make use of these videos and the information contained herein on understanding how you want to equip yourself going out into the field and how to put all of your equipment together. The biggest thing is to get out there and train. If it's not gonna be with Orion Training Group or Maneuver Training Solutions, there are a lot of other people out there that you can get training from. There are enough trainers across this country offering things like this that you can find somebody to get with, get the training from a professional, and then go out and continue that training on your own time. If your training stops at the end of a class, you will not progress, you will not have a capability. But if you go beyond the class, you continue to train, you continue to work your procedures, work your skills, you will build real capability that you can use should the need ever arise. So I'm Blake Flannery with Orion Training Group and Maneuver Training Solutions and hope to see you at class and to catch you next time.